YouTube. Welcome to the hypertrophy Q&A number five. So I actually took some questions from the Q&A number three that I hadn't finished yet. And hopefully I can get them through today for you guys and potentially start the, uh, the new batch of questions that was from the last Q&A. At this point, since we have a lot of questions coming through every single month, I'm going to ask you to please check the timestamps of every single Q&A before you ask a question. I know it might be asking a lot from you guys, but your answer is most likely already there. And if you ask a question that has already been answered perfectly in the exact same fashion that your uh, formulation represents, I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to ignore it. So just pay, uh, keep that in mind and pay heed to it, please. Okay. We are actually going to keep going until the, the battery runs off. So it can be a long Q&A, we'll see. New Life asks, best way to combine squat, deadlift volume and intensity work. My plan week day one, one heavy squat, two, day two volume deadlift, week two day one volume squat, day two heavy deadlift. Okay, so I'm going to disregard what you do. I just want to say that week one, day one heavy squat, day two volume deadlift. I don't know if you do this back to back, I always encourage people to never do squats and deadlifts on the same day if they're intensity days and to not do squats and deadlifts back to back on Monday and Tuesday, for example, because these are very taxing lifts, both for the body, for the muscles, for the amount of actual loading that they are going to put on your spine. And therefore, you need to space them out. If you look at your program in terms of physical and mental strain, these are the kings of the king. They are the ones who are going to drain you the most. So you need to space them and you will find that by doing so, the frequency is also going to be beneficial for your overall gains for the lower body. So the way I personally prescribe and recommend people do squats and deadlifts, if you want to have a four day split, for example, you can have an upper, uh, an upper on day one, a lower on day two, and then another lower on day four. And in that case, what opens upper one could be a heavy squat. What opens upper four could be a heavy deadlift. It's something that I always prescribe in my programs. That being said, it doesn't mean that you need to only do squats or deadlifts on these days. You can do variations of knee flexions or hip hinges, but you're going to do them with uh, styles that are going to be less taxing. You're not going to do them in low rep ranges to not go too intense, and you're going to focus on the volume and uh, form, in a sense. So the fact that you pair heavy squat with uh, deadlift in the style of RDRs is great, but you don't need to split them in that case. You can do your heavy squat and then follow that up by RDLs. I wouldn't say that RDLs would be a good representative of deadlifts for an intensity day. You need to have a style, regardless of the style, that is high intensity and that is going to focus on the positive. And I've covered that in my deadlift video. So that's how I personally split them. And I personally don't believe in the, the separation of volume and intensity for days. I don't like working like this. To me, if you do deadlift or squats, if they're your strength work, they're high intensity period. If you want to do uh, work that is in lower intensity rep ranges, you can do back offsets and you can do some variations with higher rep ranges or lower intensities, but these do not replace strength work. Soccer is left asks, how many times to train abs a week? And what is the best way to get the deep abs cut? Thanks. Okay. So I'll start with the deep abs cut. What people call the cut is really the, the, the ridge in between the, the muscular wall where fat usually deposits. And so for the most part, what's going to help is one, be lean, because the fat is going to go away and you'll see the cut, or two, develop your abs. Because if you think about it, if you look at it from the side, the more the abs grow and the more they bulge, the more of a cut they create. So you need to do both. Don't be super lean, there's no point, but Try to stay relatively lean and at the same time work on building the abs and the core, develop the core. Too many people think that the core is a byproduct of hypertrophy. No, you need to focus on it. Check the ab playlist for that. And the answer for how many times you need to train the abs, I train them every day. Not necessarily the best thing to do. I personally think it is quite great for the abs because they recover fast. But if you want to, to learn more, again, check the playlist. I explain that in details. And New Life actually had a second question where he asks, can I get a big back while doing only vertical pulls, weighted pull-ups in this case, and deadlifts? And the answer is yes. If you look at the big family of back builders, your deadlifts, your horizontal pulls, and your vertical pulls, in my opinion, the king of four kings is going to be the deadlift, followed by the vertical pull. 
The horizontal pole is sort of a lame duck in the family. I know some people don't like to hear that because they love their rows and I'm, I love my rows too, but in terms of overall development, you can do with just deadlift and vertical poles. If you want a better development, you of course add horizontal poles, but a simple combo of deadlifts and pull-ups is going to be great. And some people will tell you, well, you're going to lack thickness. And in my opinion, that's not true because the thickness you'll get from the deadlift. Now, if there are certain body parts, uh, certain portions of the muscle that respond best to, uh, to rows, then do it. Understand that you could even just do some type of shrug, which is technically a vertical pull, by modifying the angle of the back by hip hinging into the bar so that when you actually shrug, you shrug more with the mid back. That's a, that's a valid way to grow your back. And you can, and I think that a lot of, uh, the reason why it's actually beneficial in, in certain cases is because rows are going to be very taxing on the lower back because they're essentially a deadlift without the ability to stay tight and push with the legs because you need to pull with the elbows. And a lot of people suffer from lower back pain because of that. I will make a full video on rows to explain it, but for the people who are unsure, you can do away, you can do without rows. Of course, you can always do dumbbell rows, you can do cell rows, things that don't invoke or actually require require you to have a lot of hip hinge uh, to actually be able to row with, uh, with your back and that is also going to grow your back perfectly fine. You don't need to do barbell rows. Cameron Gormley. Hey man, I'm starting a new mesocycle. It is okay to overhead press in the 12 to 15 rep range and barbell bench press in the 8 to 10 rep range. Maybe it's just bro science, but I've heard some YouTubers say these lifts should be trained in the same rep range. Thanks. I don't know whose YouTuber's opinion you've heard about that. I would disregard what they say. Matching rep ranges can be good for synergy sometimes, but saying that it needs to be matched makes no sense. Um, I don't know if they said that because they want to make the vertical and the horizontal presses to be equal in terms of tonnage, which would, would be stupid because you're much stronger on the horizontal press and therefore even if you match the rep range the tonnage of the horizontal press is going to completely dwarf the tonnage of the overhead press so disregard that what i would say however is that if your main lift is overhead press for the day which means you're going to start it as strength work 12 to 15 is too many reps uh, 12 to 15 would be much more much better if it's a back offset and even as a back offset it's too much maybe as a variation if you want to hit it as your main Maybe do three to six reps, maybe lower the, uh, the amount of sets, etc. But bubble bench press eight to 10, I think it's perfectly fine. But yeah, you don't need to pair them. It is totally bro science. Streptococcus. Can I do close grip bench instead of skull crushers? Looking elsewhere, some people think that close grip bench is fine to replace skull crushers, but I'm wondering about it. Again, I don't know who, sa who said that, but these are not the same movements at all. One is an elbow flexion, a pure elbow flexion, might I add, uh, that should require some shoulder flexion, but not too much. And the other one is an horizontal press. They're not the same lift. A properly executed close grip bench is going to target the uh, lateral and medial heads of the tricep and the chest and shoulders to a great extent. For the school crusher, it's going to be pure long head. If you do them with uh, shoulder flexion, and if you don't do them with shoulder flexion the proper way, you're going to gain to get just mostly triceps. And so, no, they cannot be, the, they cannot be uh, entering the same rotation, they're different lifts completely, you cannot have one or the other. They just don't work the same muscles. So be careful with that. And you say it's because your bench is your weakest lift and you prefer doing them over score crushers. Well, the good thing is that score crushers are going to do almost nothing for your bench because on presses, while the long head is recruited, it's not recruited as much as you would think. So if you want something to carry over to your bench, do close grip bench. And that's that. And you say at the moment I'm doing them three or four sets of 10 to 12 as part of your novice hypertrophy program. Yes, I include them for the long head benefits. But that being said, they can of course be replaced. Be careful if you replace them because I have them in the program as uh, accessories. You cannot replace them with the close grip bench. You might have to replace one of the days or at least add to one of the days where you don't do bench uh, the close grip bench that you're interested in doing. So a day where uh, you think that you will be recovered, you can simply do close grip bench instead of push-ups. And I would recommend to move the bench day on Monday so that you can do the close grip bench at the end of the week so that you can recover easier. Two, I'm trying to get my first pull-up, okay, and have been working on doing negatives. Great. 
The problem is I do them third in my workout and I feel like I'm too fatigued to do them properly. I especially felt this after doing deadlifts or deadlift variations, okay? Can I do three sets of five to eight negative pull-ups at the start of my workout, even before heavy squats or before deadlifts? Thanks. Well, you're in luck because actually I would say that when it comes to supersetting strength work, I never superset my deadlift and my squats, but a negative pull-up is not going to take anything from you. Uh, either for deadlift or for the squat, and so I would recommend you do that. It might be an issue on deadlift if you don't use straps for your grip. In that case, just use straps for the pull-up, uh, because the goal is to train the muscles of the back, it's not to train the grip. So that would be a valid uh, option. You can try and report back. Natural hypothermia. Should you avoid intense training multiple times a day? I really enjoy training and was wondering if I did my program both in the morning and at night, would it slow progress or be for nothing? Would splitting my training be a better idea? Well, you know, splitting your training is actually valuable, it's doable. Training doesn't need to be a block, it's a block for convenience. But if it's more convenient for you or you get better gains by splitting, do it. Olympic weightlifters actually do that quite a lot and the reason why is they need repetition and they need high frequency on the snatch and the jerk and the clean as well. And therefore, it's beneficial for them to repeat those movements a ton. I would be careful if you do that for aesthetics, because it carries a lot of difficulties you're going to have to navigate around. And I would ask you to be patient, because I'm going to make a video actually about that, about splitting training, or about the way daily frequency can have an impact on your volume and intensity. So stay tuned. But understand that if you do so, you should do it in a manner that is going to have you do strength work twice a day with at least one of the two in lower intensities. So one could be more focused on volume and the other could be more focused on uh, intensity, as I said. It's going to also be a question of not hitting the same muscle groups the, those two days. So you could do chest in the morning and back in the, the evening, something like this. But that will be fully discussed. Big W. What workout did you do to transform your body the way you did? as you showed in the 10 year transformation video and workouts to get massive arms. Okay, so I'm, I explained it already in the video, but I just started at the bottom and I slowly raised. I started by doing push-ups on my knees, by curling the literal pink dumbbells that I struggled to curl, to then uh, two years later, so we're talking a two year span of me just doing push-ups and abs, uh, lifting some dumbbells, so some five kilo dumbbells, I did that for three years. I did a uh, dumbbell only workout every single day for three years. That's a thousand days of only dumbbell. Then I moved on to a gym, barbell movements, etc., etc., And I've been at barbell movements for five years. So that's pretty much that. If you want to see what I do to train, you can just check the, the training playlist. And for the, the massive arms, it's easy. You train them. Most people who have small arms don't train them. Just train them for years and years and they'll grow. And if you want to know how to program an arm day, check the playlist as well. Tomer, any progression methods, tips for pull-ups, chin-ups? I can only do three to six reps. You can do grease the groove method. That's great for progression on the pull-up. You can do them more frequently, which is technically also a way to do grease the groove. You can make them as nucleus overload, even though it's really not the best for progression. It's more for size. You can really do whatever you want. The, the beauty with pull-ups is that they're not taxing at all. If you mix the grips and you know how to do them properly, and so I would recommend you not be too skittish with the amount of punishment you inflict your upper back. You can really up your volume on the, the pull-ups. And what you could even do is a week where you take it a little bit to the extreme or you do too much, and then you give yourself two to three days to recover, and then you hit it again. I'm guaranteeing you that you will, do, you will have a PR on that day. Pull-ups progression really just comes out to doing it enough to stimulate, but not enough to make it so that you come the next day already fatigued. And you'll see also that by upping the frequency, you're going to become able to do them almost every day. At this point, I do them every day. DBF, here is a tonnage puzzle for you. Could you detail how one would go about maximizing tonnage, particularly in the back posterior chain, with only a flimsy pull-up bar, plus flimsy parallel dip bars, plus two kilogram kettlebells? I am limited to such equipment for two months. Okay, well, I'm a little bit late, aren't I? Because your question was asked two months ago, I think. Uh, but I can still answer, it's a, it's a good puzzle. So, especially for, you ask for the posterior chain. Well, you're going to do a metric amount of um, kettlebell swings, as much as you can, really, you're going to treat it like cardio. You're going to do uh, uphill lunges holding the kettlebells. 
you are going to do Romanian deadlift uh, with the kettlebell, you're going to do goblet squats with the kettlebell. And in terms of flimsy pull-up bar and flimsy parallel dip bars, that covers your horizontal pull, uh, your horizontal presses, your vertical pulls. You can do knee raises on the pull-up bar. You can attach bands to do triceps and biceps on the pull-up bar. You really, I mean, I, that's my belief, but as long as there's a will, there is a way. Regardless of the equipment you have, you can always make things happen. I have a program in the anime workout playlist where it's a full program with only a pull-up bar. Uh, it's, yeah, it's only a pull-up bar and bends, and that works perfectly fine. So that's what I would do in your uh, position, but I don't know if you're still in that position. And then we have the reef, and the reason why I kept, uh, we're actually through, nice. The reason why I kept the reef for the end is because, and I think I'm mispronouncing his name again, is because Mr. Zarif has really good questions, but they tend to be really long. So let's see. Kept it for the end because it's interesting. Okay. So it's, no, it's actually that. It's Zarif Aktab. Okay. So he asks, after the discussion we had on evolving rep ranges, he asks uh, about rotation. He, the exercise rotation. Okay. And he explains that he has several days, upper A, upper B, upper C, etc. And he doesn't know how the, the days are going to interact with one another and how the lifts are going to replace each other. And that's a, that's a good question. So I'm actually going to make a full video about that. Uh, so I'm not going to answer to everything you have now, but keep in mind that I will actually use your question to navigate when I make that video, because it's going to be a video about gentleman's plate. So you should know more about it. I would say, however, that having an upper, upper ABC it's maybe a bit too much. It's a lot of RUD. A lot. I don't know if you need it. You could potentially cut back and take the C, the elements of the C, and spread them on the A and B. The issue if you have an ABC is that most likely your specificity is going to be lowered and you're going to be working outside of any relevant range. So be careful with that. Because the way the rotation is supposed to work is you have the lift that replace another one, but they're still similar enough that they're going to carry over to one another and the tonnage is going to be relevant. That's the essence of the rotations within the gentleman split. And the, the benefit of that too is that it's going to lower the chance of injury because it's going to modify the joint angles. So it, it uh, avoids overuse injuries. The issue with that is, again, you don't get as much practice as uh, you would need in reality if you do, this, do it like this because you don't repeat the lifts as much. And it might also represent something that across the board is going to make programming too complicated. Because understand that for each rotation you have, and each upper A or B you have, you have to echo that throughout the program. So, taking a quick glance at your, at your uh, question, I also see that you're asking me if it should be strength-focused or volume-focused. And that's an issue. Because if a lift, and that's just the way I program, but if a lift on day A is intensity focused, on day B, it's going to be intensity focused too. Because the, the line, the set that it takes place within represents intensity. If you start rotating volume and intensity on top of exercise selection, and you have to keep in mind specificity as well, you're really making your life much harder. So stay tuned because I will make that video and I think that uh, explaining it will be much clearer. And now, we are going to move on to the next Q&A, which was the hypertrophy Q&A number four, where I had some questions in there as well. So let's see. On this Q&A, we have Up, up, up. Tomer, who asks, how do I know when you hit, when, how to know when you hit your maximum recoverable volume on certain muscle groups? Let's say I did a reset and now I'm back to my PR weight and it feels like I'm about to fall next, no, next workout. That has been explained in the hypertrophy series, I think a week ago. So you can go check it out. It has to do with the baseline. Tomer again, what difference on the quality of the workout will it make if I, let, if I superset between some exercises? Okay, if let's say I superset between some exercises and therefore my workout is less than two hours or one, or I'm not supersetting anything and therefore my workouts are above two hours. Is this just a matter of time because it is the same volume but less time? That's a good question. So understand that 
If you have the same amount of tonnage on one hour or two hours, it means one of two things. Either it means that when it took two hours, you were sandbagging, you were taking too much rest because you're able to do it for in one hour with a literal hour less of rest time of, of just rest in between the sets, you're still able to perform with the same reps and the same weight. That shows that there was an issue with the two hour workout. You, it wasn't compressed enough, it was lazy. If you cannot replicate the performance of the one hour workout, uh, of the two hour workout in one hour, it means that you're not resting enough. Or it means that for the two hour workout, you're diving too deep into the baseline and you're starting to work in irrelevant intensity windows. And that could also be the case. And again, you need to check the video about the baseline to understand that. I'm sure that it's going to make it much clearer for you. And supersets, again, when done properly, are perfectly viable and they don't reduce performance as much as people think. Or at least the trade-off between performance and tonnage accumulation is beneficial. It's, it's in your favor. Okay, asks, A. Hey, Started evolving, uh, adopting evolving rep ranges. One question is, how do you track your weight and reps? I used to use Excel for people, but I find with evolving rep range, it's a bit more difficult. Yes, it is. S and you say, considering giant sets swell, exactly. Could you show us how you literally take notes and track your weights, sets, and reps? Well, you know what? Why not? Give me one second. I'm going to grab my log and I'm going to show it to you guys. Done. And I'm actually going to make a full video about it, but it doesn't hurt to show you quickly here. So, for example, and you can see the camera here. So as you can see, I don't know if you're going to be able to read, but this is my squ volume squat there, which is uh, basically a an, an lower A. And it squats. I have metal symbols here that I might explain in the video, but it, it's a, it is, it's a symbol of the way the, the set is going to evolve. The amount of uh, top sets is M3. And then you see the weights here. And so if I get it closer, you can see that it started at 355 for four, then 355 for five, which means in my, in my case, five is going to mean uh, five, four. And six is six five four, seven is seven five three, eight is eight six four, and then reset back to uh, um, to more weight and uh, more weight for four sets. And that's the way I write it down. So you see, you have all of my exercises for the day, and they're all logged like this. So that's the way I log the weight. Now with the program, if I can get it with only one hand. For the program. For the program, what I do is not complicated too, is I just have my piece of paper. As you can see here, that's my program. So here you have arm accessory. Maybe I'm stupid and it's going to be inversed on the camera. I think I'm stupid. It's fine. Uh, so you have my my Day one for arm day, you have the list of all the exercises I do and they rotate. So that's a concept that I'm going to explain in later videos, but I have only two iterations of each day, which makes eight in total. But in reality, I have much more than that because each day has six main exercises that are going to be arranged in supersets, but I don't do them all the time because if I did, I would spend six hours in the gym every day. In reality, what I do is I do my works, my strength work, which always happens, and the rest is coming in and out. So one day I'll do one after the strength work, so one uh, one line, which is four sets, and then maybe one line of three sets and then four sets, etc. But to me, what I do is I separate the, the workout plan and the workout log, but it's essential you log your workout. I'll make a video about that. But yeah, for the evolving rep range, you're going to want to have the weight for the day, and the evolving rep range that floats above it and you need to create um, you need to create short markings things that are going to be much easier to track you can't always write the full rep range so for me for example an 864 is 8 and you can come up with your own methods Karim Altawanzi 
Hey, how do you suggest people implement recovery in a six-day program? I know you said you're not a proponent of deloading, but lately my body doesn't feel right. I've heard implementing high rep range for injury prevention is something I should consider. So six days in a row is for one of two people. One, novices that don't have a lot of work capacity, but recover fast enough that they can hit the same body part every single day so that they can actually get a lot of technical ability and development. Or for people who are more advanced and who are going to need to train six times a week to accumulate a relevant amount of volume to progress, which is my case. In your case, I would say, try and cut back. Try and see if within those six days, you can just make it four days. Because in reality, and that's, that's also one of the earliest question, you could potentially do the same amount of volume in four days as you did at six, but the two rest days you're going to free yourself up for are going to be more beneficial for recovery than the amount of time you would have spent not training on the days that would have been shorter if you did only six days, if that makes sense. So try that out. If deloading works for you, deload. I don't personally recommend deload because in my opinion, you can prevent the need of deloading from within the program. And because bodybuilding is not a sport where you're supposed to peak at some point, it is highly doable. And as far as the high rep ranges, that is true. I would call that strength restoration. Don't get it confused with high rep range within relevant intensity windows. That can still make the injury worse. What you want is you're going to take the movement out of the relevant intensity window. The goal is just to grease the movement and to send blood in the area. Check the video I made about uh, restoration strength. Angus Rowe, thanks for answering my question. I've really struggled to be in the gym less than five times a week for mental health. Okay, so that's just thanking me. Well, thank you, Angus. After that. Haida, you said in a video that you missed the one arm cable row in commercial gyms. Did you do it for activation, activation purpose or main exercise in your program? I personally never had an issue activating my lat on anything, or at least not on pause. I mean, it's normal. If you cannot activate your lat on a deadlift, it's normal. You're not supposed to. They're supposed to stabilize, not pull. I used it as a finisher because I've always found that with these machines, whether you start it at the, the, just the beginning of the workout or the end, your strength doesn't vary much. It's something I've always found funny where the, the baseline with machine is not the same as with weights or with body weight. So I would just do it at the end of a deadlift day. I would go for the, the pump, basically. Uh, one arm, perfect form for the stretch, which is something I miss because getting an horizontal stretch in a sitting position is really tough when you don't have a cable machine. It wasn't the main exercise. Though. It, it's... <sighs> Pro bodybuilders are going to tell you that you can build big lats with it. I don't agree. It's something to finish the lats, but pull-ups, rows are going to be much more beneficial for the hypertrophy of that uh, certain muscle group. Kosmin Rotaru. Is it true that men have more androgen receptors in the upper body compared to the legs? As in, do the torso and arms grow faster than the legs because of a training bias, or is there a genetic underlying cause as well? That's a good question. I mean... I made a video about should women train like men, and I had people in the comment tell me that women had the same, if not better, hypertrophic, hypertrophic um, capacities as men. And that's a misunderstanding of science, and it's what I would call a contrarian point of view or stance. It's people who've been told their entire life men are stronger or bigger than women, and they read one article saying the opposite, and they're like, wow, that's cool. I'm going to repeat that to every single person I know because it's going to make me look smart. It, for anyone who has a brain, it doesn't make these people look smart. It makes let, let them look stupid and dogmatic. Men are, of course, uh, much more prone to becoming bigger. And you can say it's androgen receptors. In reality, it's, it's everything. It's biology. It's the way our upper body is shaped. We have a big upper body to be able to flow things. We have a much smaller hip-to-shoulder ratio. We have much denser bones, we have denser muscles, we have deeper attachments in the muscles, etc. We're built to be muscular. It's, it's what men are supposed to be. I don't know if it's androgen receptors or not. I know that the traps, the shoulders, and the arms tend to have a lot of androgen receptors. And whether you have the receptors or not, if you don't produce the uh, chemical that is going to tie with the receptor, it doesn't matter. Women could have 
more androgen receptors, it, they don't produce the androgen hormones, so it doesn't do anything. That's sort of the issue too. And also the reason why, if a girl takes enough juice, she can have capped shoulders, she can have massive arms, she can have traps. They have androgen receptors as well. It's just that na nature doesn't really want them to fulfill that role. Just like you as a man has estrogen receptors in your glutes, in your hips, but they don't grow massively like a woman's would. They don't carry fat like a woman's would. Why? It's not your biological role as a male. You're supposed to be top heavy. They're supposed to be bottom heavy. And there's also a training bias in this. It's biology and it's culture. Me women tend to not work their arms. And even in when they do, they don't get as impressive of, of results, which is discouraging, etc. Okay, that's not a question either. That's more of a program review. Post as program review. Because this is for general questions about hypertrophy. I'm, I'm surprised that the, the battery is actually holding up. That's a very brave phone. That's a nutrition question. Nutrition Q&A. We will get to a point where people know what to pose the question. I am, I am confident. Okay. Borsak Lopez, which charming name, by the way, grease the groove press ups. Will the lack of impact and scapular restriction make it, make it possible? I don't know what a press up is. Is it an overhead press? For the grease the groove, be careful with grease the groove for anything that recruits a lot of joints, especially if it's a barbell movement, because that's a recipe for overuse injury. Uh, in reality, grease the groove for for bench or stuff like this, for overhead press, it's more of a Bulgarian light approach, but you're just removing the intensity. So in reality, it's not the worst. You're going to be really good technically at it, but you're not going to be technically uh, proficient at it for heavy weights. So maybe, I wouldn't even say for beginners it's good, because beginners should just go in the gym, lift weights that are heavy for them, and just go home. So I'm not sure if that would work. Sahid Damian Nunez Marino. Is front lever raises comparable to pullover? I would say no, uh, because in the front lever, unless I'm completely mistaken, the lats are stabilizing the movements. They're not really doing the movement. So they're not the same movement. And front lever are, are of course, much more difficult than pullovers. They will work your lats, of course, but it's not going to be the stretch that you get from the pullover. It's more going to be a contraction. Gabelon Guinos, any thoughts about jawline aesthetics? Can it be improved or is it all genetics? Yes, it can be improved. You have muscles in your jaw. Um, it's a lot of genetic too because the muscles of the jaw are going to, and you won't see it here because I have my beard, but they are habiting the chin. So the more prominent the chin is and the more detailed it is naturally, the more the jaw muscles are going to pop. But you can make them grow bigger if you want to. It's possible. It's a muscle. It's a small muscle. It's like if you ask me, can you grow your hand? Well, yeah, you can grow the hand. This here is muscle. You have tiny muscles all throughout the hand. Can you get it massive? No, because the, the size of the muscle at the start is small. So hypertrophy won't get it massive. It's the reason why your leg measurement is going to be much bigger than your arm measurement. Because the base state of the leg is bigger than the arm. That being said, I would be really careful with that. Because the methods to grow the jaw tend to be sketchy. It tends to be biting into something. It tends to be weird movements with the neck, which you really don't want to do. Because the issue with the jaw is that you train it through the teeth. And the teeth are going to be the limiting factor. And you do not want to destroy your teeth just to have a cool looking jaw. And also, a uh, cool, uh, cool uh, side effect of that just like any muscle, if you train the jaw too much, it can become tense and you can develop issues. And the thing is that if you develop issues in your triceps, big deal. If you develop issues with your jaw and you can't chew anymore and you can't slip because it hurts all the time, it's going to be a pain. So be careful with that, with that endeavor. I don't think it's worth it. Robert, Roger, sorry, Roger Norberg. 
And that I think is going to be the last question for the day. So Rob, Roberg asks, I'm confused about this pre-fatiguing of a muscle before camp on exercise. Seems, seems like a flawed idea. If I do flies first, won't the triceps and shoulders just take over more during the bench, thus worsening my chesticle gains? Thank you in advance. It would if you pre-fatigued it for real, for real, meaning that you don't want to do a set of heavy chest flies before the bench. What you can do is take an easy bend and just do some standing flies. And you'll get a pump, you'll get sensation, but it's not going to tire you. Why? Because work that doesn't take place into any relevant intensity window cannot attack the baseline of the muscle. It can make the muscle feel something, but it doesn't damage the fibers. And therefore, it doesn't have the ability to make the bench worse. So that's, that won't happen. Keep in mind also that even if, and that's a big if, you manage to pre-fatigue the chest to the point that it is going to be completely taxed before you even bench, for the shoulders and triceps to take over, it would require you to have a pre-existing form that has those muscles take over. And therefore, it won't really change anything at the end of the day. Uh, if you do it properly, in reality, it's just going to help you activate the chest more. And that's going to be that for this day. I have a few other questions for this Q&A, but we actually tackled most of it. I appreciate your questions as always. I recommend you to check the Q&As because we always have uh, subscribers with a heart of gold that do the timestamps for you so that you don't have to look at 40 minutes of video. You can just click on the question that you want and that's going to save you time and that's going to help me get to the heart of these Q&As and answer new questions every single month. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.